Okay, so I think we should start. Um, we have a couple of people online, or is it just, yeah, two so far. So I took a look at the, uh, for those of you who are online, I took a look at the video and I'm first, I'm gonna repeat, when there's a question from in the class, from in person, I will repeat it so you guys can hear it because that wasn't caught by the microphone. And also I'll try to write a little bit larger. Uh, there's only so much I can do because I have to draw pictures and, and you know do some complicated proofs. So I can't, can't write too big, uh, but I'll do a little bit bigger. Uh, and for some reason, the color doesn't really come up on the YouTube video. Hopefully when you're watching it on Zoom, you can see the colors better than on YouTube, but I think it's still worth putting in the colors for those of you who are in, in the room because it helps to, to see the pictures. Um, I think that was all I was gonna say. Oh, and, and I'm not gonna use the edge boards because it's harder to see those. Okay, so we're still kind of reviewing things that I expect people to know, uh, even though I know you don't know it all. But because it's not the point of the course, I'm kind of going through it quickly, giving sketch arguments, letting you fill in the details. And it's really, uh, I'm really following more or less chapters uh, one, two, and four of Do Carmo. When we go back to do three, we'll do it, we'll do it very carefully. Um, so, so that's going to be, again, take up all the 80 minutes today and probably half of uh, Wednesday as well before we finally get to the, to the stuff that, well, what I'm probably going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to do some of chapter three before chapter four, even though I'm assuming chapter four is a review and not chapter three. So when I'll, I'll make that clear when we get to it. So what did we do last time? We had a, a smooth manifold. We have a Riemannian metric on it. I said, there's lots of Riemannian metrics on, on any smooth manifold. And from, from the Riemannian metric, we got what's called the Levi-Civita connection. So here's our Riemannian manifold. This gives us the Levi-Civita connection which was a way to take covariant derivatives or take some kind of directional derivatives of vector fields in the direction of tangent vectors, okay? So if, if X and Y were vector fields on M, then nabla XY is a vector field on M. And we had various uh, properties, right? That it was linear in X, not just over the reals, but over smooth functions. It was linear over the reals in Y and it had a Leibniz rule. So we had nabla FX, Y was F nabla X, Y and nabla X of F, Y was X applied to F times Y plus F nabla X, Y. That was the Leibniz rule. Okay, and I told you things that these, these two equations imply that, that it's pointwise, it's tensorial in X. So it really only depends, if you evaluate this at a point P, it only depends on X at P and it's local in Y. This, this Leibniz rule shows you that it's local in Y. It only depends on Y in a neighborhood of P. And you can even do better than that. You can even show that it only depends on Y along any arbitrary curve uh, passing through P with initial velocity XP, okay? Uh, so that was the covariant derivative. And, and there was a theorem. So this has certain properties, right? It's metric compatible and it's torsion free. And if you, if you insist that your covariant derivative has those properties that exist and is unique given the metric. If you change metrics, you get a different Levi-Civita connection. We're usually gonna be working with a fixed metric. It has a fixed Levi-Civita connection. Um, but what we wanna do, sometimes we're, we're not gonna have, uh, remember this thing to differentiate Y, it really only matters what's happening to Y along a curve passing through P in the direction of X and P. It doesn't even really have to be defined away from that curve. So we're gonna make that more precise by defining what it means to differentiate a vector field that's defined only along a curve. So first we have to define what is a vector field that's defined only along a curve. So vector fields along a curve. So let's let alpha from A, B, to M be a smooth curve. I'm not gonna always write the word smooth, but it's always smooth. Definition, a vector field along alpha is a smooth map, let's say X from the domain of this curve into the tangent bundle such that x, uh, x composed alpha, uh, x of t, sorry, x of t is in 
the tangent space at alpha of t of m for all t. And again, since this is a closed interval, what we really mean is that this is the restriction of a smooth map to something defined on a, on a larger open interval. And X2 is, is also the restriction like that. Um, in other words, so if you know about vector bundles and pullbacks, you can ignore this if you don't, i.e. X is a section, smooth section of the pullback bundle. alpha star of tm. If that sentence doesn't make sense, you can ignore it. It's not important. So let me draw a picture. Here's our manifold M. The curve alpha could cross itself. Sorry. There's no reason that alpha has to be injective. And let's say this is the time, uh, this is the point alpha of t naught. We have some tangent vector to m. My color chalk is breaking very quickly. This is um, x at t naught. Okay. And that lies in the tangent space to m at alpha of t naught. And I might have some other time. T1, this is this is alpha of T1, and here I have X at T1 lies in the tangent space at alpha of T1 of M. So let me see if I can draw these tangent spaces here. Okay, so notice alpha need not be injective. So if there exists T1 and T2 not, not equal, such that alpha of T1 equals alpha of T2, we need not have um, X of T1 equals X of T2. So in this picture, let me get a different color. Um, I've drawn this picture so that there's a point of intersection we cross it first at some time uh, coming this way. We might have X, um, let's call this T3, T2. And then it might come back to this point at time T3 and X at time T3 might be different, right? That's okay. Um, so here's an example of a vector field along a curve. Example, let X be a smooth vector field on M. Then what we can do is we can restrict it or pull it back to alpha. We get a vector field along alpha which I'll still denote by X. Oh, let me just, let me not do that. Um, by um, X compose alpha. Right? Why does this work? Because first of all, alpha and X are both smooth maps. So the composition is smooth. And if I compute um, X compose alpha of T, that's X at alpha of T, right? I first apply the map alpha to T, I get the point alpha of T and I, evalu I, evalu I evaluate the vector field X at that point, I write it as a subscript. And this is in T alpha T of M because X is a vector field, is a section of the tangent bundle. Okay. Um, so this is called the pullback or restriction of X to the curve alpha. Um, restriction I put in quotation marks because it only makes sense to think of it as a restriction if alpha is actually injective, right? If alpha is not injective, this is, not, this is, this is honestly a pullback by a smooth map. 
but it's not a, a restriction. Uh, because you, if you want to say, I, I'm going I'm to let x uh, at any point on the image of this curve, I'm going to define the vector field to be uh, the value of x at the, um, maybe I'm saying too much. Maybe it's better not, not to say that. So I, I, in fact, what I'll do is I'll, I'll say the following. Um, Here's an, if, I, if I give another example, and then it'll clarify what I was trying to say here. The velocity vector field alpha prime of alpha defined by alpha prime of uh, well, we know what it is, is a smooth vector field along alpha. So this alpha prime is a smooth map from A, B to the tangent bundle given by at the time T, this is the velocity of alpha at time T. And we know that this is a tangent vector to M at alpha T. So again, if this is my curve alpha, then at every time t, I have a velocity vector field. And this varies smoothly in t. And you see if the curve intersects itself, uh, it could be that, that you know, let's say you have a circle going around, then, then even though it has self-intersections, the velocity is always uh, unique, okay? but here it's not. So this is not the velocity vector field in general is in general not the restriction to alpha of a smooth vector field on M, okay? Because it could have these kinds of self-intersections and the velocity might disagree at different points. But in general, if you have a vector field along uh, a curve, and let's say that curve doesn't have self-intersections, so it's injective map, then you can always locally find uh, a smooth vector field defined on an open set containing the image of that curve, whose restriction is your ve vector field along the curve. And then by cutting it off to zero using cutoff functions, you can find a global vector field whose restriction to the curve is the given vector field if, if the curve has no self intersections and sometimes even more generally. Okay? We're not going to usually need to do that, but sometimes it'll come up. Um, okay. So now that we know what a curve along, what a vector field along a curve is, now we're going to define covariant differentiation um, of vector fields along a curve. Okay, so proposition, fix a curve alpha, smooth curve, there exists a unique uh, R linear map, R linear operator on the space of smooth vector fields along alpha, and I just realized um, I should have said that this space of vector fields along alpha is a uh, real vector space, and it's a module over C infinity AB. Uh, so in other words, if I have two vector fields along alpha, I can add them. I get a vector field along alpha. I can multiply them by, I think, a real linear combination. I can also multiply them by a smooth function, real value function on AB, and I'll get a smooth vector field along alpha. This is obvious if you know about pullbacks, right? It just says that the sections of the pullback bundle are, are also uh, have these properties. So, so fix a curve, 
then there exists a unique R linear operator on this space um, denoted dt called covariant differentiation along alpha. Um, such that, so I have to give you um, the properties of this operation, and then I'll make a remark before we prove it, such that, first of all, if I take dt and I, I apply it to a function times a vector field along alpha, so this is a vector field along alpha, and this is in C infinity of AB, then this is going to have, it's going to be DF dt times V plus F dtv. This is the Leibniz rule. And two, if V is the restriction to alpha, of a vector field V tilde on M, then uh, dtv, this is a vector field along the curve. So if I evaluate it at some point t naught, this is equal to the covariant derivative upstairs of, on, on m in the direction of alpha prime t naught of v tilde for all t naught in a, b. Okay, so it says that it, had, it has this kind of Leibniz rule. If I take my vector field along the curve multiplied by a function, and then I want to take this covariant differentiation along the curve. I first differentiate the function. There's only one thing that could mean f prime times v. And then I don't differentiate the function and I do this differentiation on v. And then, as I said, sometimes a vector field along a curve is the restriction to the curve of a vector field on the whole space. And when it is, we want this thing at the time t naught to be just the covariant differentiation of this vector field whose restriction is v in the alpha prime t naught direction. Okay, these properties are going to serve to prove that it exists and is unique, and I'll show you in a minute. But before I do that, let me make a remark. This is very ambiguous notation. Right, because it doesn't tell you the curve alpha anywhere. If I had some other curve beta, I'd get a different operation. Right, it's going to be safe because we're usually only going to have one curve. That's going to be, it's going to be clear. And when we have two curves in the problem, which we will soon, uh, we're going to use different letters for the parameters. So I might have alpha, alpha, which is parameterized by T, and beta, which is parameterized by S. So when I write D sub T, I'll mean covariant differentiation along the curve alpha, whose parameter is T, and D sub S will mean covariant differentiation along beta, whose parameter is S. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so the, the question is, this is the same as the pullback connection. The answer is yes. I'll, I'll say that after I give the proof. That's right. Okay, so I'm going to give a sketch of the proof again, because this is, again, something that I would like to assume, and I'll let you fill in the details. So in local coordinates, x1 up to xn, um, we can write v at time t as um, a j of t d by dx j at alpha of t, where these a j's are smooth real valued functions uh, on a b. Well, uh, let's see, does this make sense? Let me say smooth functions of t. So I might have to restrict the, 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 the domain of T so that I'm in the uh, domain of this coordinate chart. So the alpha of T maps into this coordinate chart. Um, and alpha prime is going to be dxi dt uh, at T times d by dxi at T, at alpha of T. So again, these are some, some over i, some over j. Then what would dtv have to be by the 
so we're going to first find it, give a formula for what it would have to be. Suppose there was such a DT satisfying one and two. By the R linearity, um, it doesn't matter where I put the sum, I'm not even writing the summation symbol, right? There was a sum over J here, I can pull it out because it's R linear. And by the uh, property one, this is gonna be DAJ dt times d by dx j plus a j times dt of d by dx j. And now we look at the second term, I'm taking dt of the vector field d by dx j, and certainly d by dx j is, it's a vector field, it's the restriction to alpha of a vector field on M, because the d by dx j vector field is defined on some open neighborhood of, of these points. And if you want, you can even cut it off and make it global. So by property two, this is going to be the first term, nothing happens to the first term. And the second term is going to be nabla alpha prime of T uh, d by dx j. And then this is, um, let me just change my, uh, dummy index of summation here. This thing is dxi dt d by dxi of d by dxj. Again, by the properties of, of NABLA, I can pull this function out and then I'm going to have Christoffel symbols. So this is dak dt plus dxi dt aj gamma kij at alpha of t, these are all at t, right? I'm being a little bit sloppy, d by dx k at alpha of t, okay? So this tells us what dt of v would have to be in local coordinates if such, a, if such an operator existed using the properties that we want for it to, to satisfy, it would have to be this. And now to complete the proof, you just have to show that if you defined an operator in local coordinates, if you defined it so that in local coordinates it was this, you need to show it's well-defined and it has the required properties. So now I'll leave this as an exercise. Use star to define dt. Show it's well-defined independent of the choice of coordinates. And that's a bit of a slog because you have to know how the Christoffel symbols transform in a different coordinate chart, but it all works out. Um, and show DT has the required properties. In other words, R linear one and two, okay? So this is just a, a calculation. And then to answer Robert's question, there exists a slick way of doing this. Because um, DT is nothing more than the pullback by alpha of, of this connection. Okay, so if you know what pullbacks of connections are, you know, this obviously exists and has the properties that we want. But again, I'm not assuming that you know what this means, so you can ignore it. Um, actually, this means this d by dt, that's better, d by dt. That's the global vector field on the interval AB. Okay, so we have this notion of covariant differentiation along a curve. We're going to be using this very frequently. In fact, today for the next half hour or so. Um, but as I said, at some point, especially when we're talking about comparing uh, families of geodesics, we're gonna have multiple curves in the story and we're gonna be looking at covariant differentiation along, along these different curves. So we'll, we'll have to be careful with our notation. D, we'll have DT and DS, which are gonna correspond to covariant differentiation along two different curves. It's, it's poorly chosen notation, but if you want the notation to be much more uh, precise, and it gets unwieldy, right? 
So we want to avoid having to put too much decoration on our symbols. Okay, so the next notion, now that we know covariant differentiation along a curve is that of parallel transport. So what is this? So I'm going to draw a picture before I say any words. Again, we're going to start with a curve, alpha. So this will be the um, initial point, and this will be the final point. So we have a tangent space to M at the initial point, and we have a tangent space to, Q, to M at the final point. And what this process of parallel transport is going to do for us is it's going to give us a way, given the curve, we have to fix the curve, and of course the metric and the covariant derivative is fixed throughout. It's going to take tangent vectors um, to M at the initial point of the curve, and we're going to tra translate them. We're going to follow them along somehow along this curve to get some uh, tangent vector at the final point. Okay, so I haven't told you yet how to do this, but this is the motivation, this is the idea. So let alpha be a curve, smooth curve. Um, alpha of A is P, alpha of B is Q, and let XP be a tangent vector at P. Okay, so I'm not assuming that that there's some vector field X on M whose value at P is XP. Although of course there always will be, I can always uh, define it in local coordinates, cut it down by a bump function, I can do that, but I don't need that. I just need a tangent vector, okay? Then there exists a unique vector field X along the curve alpha uh, such that first of all, DT X equals zero on AB. Remember, this is, this is a vector field along alpha. It's the covariant derivative in the direction uh, alpha prime, if you want, of the vector field X. So we want it to not change its covariant derivative to be zero and uh, X at time A to be XP. Remember, at X at time A uh, is, is a tangent vector at P, which is alpha of A. Okay, so this is the, well, let me say, let me write over here. Um, one says alpha is parallel, but not alpha, X is parallel or covariantly constant. constant along alpha and two is an initial condition. Okay, so you see, I say, given the curve and given this initial tangent vector, I can find a unique vector field along alpha that's parallel along alpha and has this initial value. If I chose some other initial value, I get some other vector field along alpha. So how do we prove this? Again, it's all on the board for us already. So sketch in a local coordinate chart, x1 up to xn, we have, we've done this computation now. Um, we can write X, we're looking for X, right? It's gonna be AI V by DXI. Um, and AI is a smooth function of T. And it's still here, DTX in local coordinates is DAK DT plus DXI DT AJ gamma KIJ at alpha of T. Uh, d by dxk. 
This is this is all at t. Okay. So we want this to be zero. That's property one. And of course, this is a basis at every point. That means we want this to equal zero for all t. Okay. So let's see, make sure we understand here. The metric is fixed. That means the Christoffel symbols are fixed. These are some horrible functions of x1 up to xn, but we can calculate them. And the curve is fixed, right? So the xi's as functions of t, that's the parameterization of the curve. So we know the dxi dt's and the alpha of t's and the, and the gamma. If you want, let me write this as x1 of t up to xn of t. We know all the gammas and we know this, these things here. We're looking for the a's. So this is a first order linear system of ODEs for A1 up to AN, okay? The, it tells you that the first derivatives of the A's plus some linear combination of the A's has to be zero. And from the ODE theorem, the Picard-Lindelof theorem, we know that given initial conditions, because these coefficients are all smooth, given initial conditions, there exists a unique smooth solution. By the ODE theorem, given initial conditions, which we are given, right? The values of the AIs at, at, the, at the initial time t zero, t equals zero, is, the, is given by the, the vector field, the vector tangent vector x sub p. So given initial conditions, there exists a unique smooth solution. Uh, and because the ODE is linear, this exists for all time. For all time uh, for which the equation makes sense. So this is a very important property of linear ODEs that the uh, solution exists for all time. So if you're not familiar with the ODE theorem, uh, I think in Lee's book on smooth manifolds in the appendix in the second edition, he gives a full proof of that and, and proves the, you know, you can prove the ODE theorem for local existence using a contraction mapping theorem. It's a fixed point argument. But if you want to get the long time existence for linear equations, it's a slightly different argument and that, that's all done in Lee. Um, what do I say by when the equation makes sense? I'm writing it here in local coordinates, right? So if, if the time gets too big, the image alpha of t of the curve is going to leave my coordinate chart possibly. And then I can't write this down, okay? Um, if I had global coordinates, there's no, there's no issue. It exists for all time. But then what do you do? Well, now you just have to patch it together. So I'll draw a picture. Here's my curve. Maybe I can cover it. Well, I know I can cover it by a finite number of domains of coordinate charts because the, the image of the curve is compact, right? And I can cover every, every point lies in the image of a chart, in the domain of a chart. So I can cover it by a finite number of charts and then you piece it together. So now you cover the image of alpha by a finite number of uh, domains of charts and piece it together, piece together a solution using the local uniqueness of the ODE theorem. So what do I mean there? I just showed you in this chart Oh, I used the orange already. Okay. So here as my initial XP, I can find an X up to here in local coordinates. Now, let me take this as my new initial condition. And I can, I can find a solution in this chart. Okay. And in the places where the two charts overlap, because of the local existence and uniqueness theorem of the ODs, this, this solution patches together. It agrees. It gives you a global, smooth, unique solution. Okay, again, that's a sketch argument. Are there any questions? Or are there any questions online? If there are any questions online, just yell out question because I can't, I can't see people's hands. 
or the check. Okay, so I wanna emphasize two things here. First of all, the, the reason it exists for the whole length of the curve for all the time that we care about is because the ODE is linear. And also what's, what's the given data here? The curve is fixed, alpha, and the initial tangent vector XP is fixed. Then we find the solution. And the reason I'm emphasizing that because in about 10 minutes, we're gonna start talking about geodesics. And again, we're gonna invoke the ODE theorem but this time, exactly what we're looking for is going to be slightly different. And we're going to get a nonlinear equation, which only guarantees short time existence. Okay, so but before we talk about geodesics, uh, we got to finish talking about parallel transport. Now, given alpha, define a map capital pi sub alpha which is gonna go from TPM to TQM. Remember, this was the initial point of the curve and this is the final point. This is called parallel transport along alpha by um, pi alpha. It's going to take a tangent vector to m at p and give me a tangent vector to m at q. The definition is that it's equal to x b, which is in t alpha b m, where x is the unique smooth vector field along alpha with uh, dtx equals zero on a b and x at a is xp. We just showed that there exists such a unique um, uh, x. So again, there's my curve alpha. This is the point p, this is the point q. Given any xp here, I'm going to get some uh, pi alpha of xp at this point. And if I chose some other tangent vector, I would get something else at the final point. Okay, so, uh, so that's the definition. Let me state some facts which um, are immediate, and I'll give you the idea of how to prove them if they're not completely obvious. So facts. First of all, pi alpha is linear. And that this makes sense to ask because it go, it's a map between two vector spaces, okay? And this is linear, this is because the parallel transport ODE is a linear ODE. So linear combinations of solutions are solutions. In other words, if I have XP and YP at the initial point and I find the X of T or the Y of T, these solutions, uh, then uh, if I take AX plus BY, let me not use A and B. If I take TX plus, oh, no, I'll use T there. Uh, okay, if I take, uh, what should I do? If I take Lambda X plus Mu Y, if X and Y, if X and Y satisfy uh, DT equals zero, this is gonna be Lambda DTX plus mu dty, uh, that's gonna be zero. And if I evaluate this at time, uh, at time a, I'm gonna get lambda xp plus mu yp. So by the uniqueness, that means that uh, this is the unique uh, vector field along the curve, which is parallel along the curve with the initial condition lambda xp plus mu yp at, at p. So that means that the parallel transport 
pi alpha lambda xp plus mu yp is lambda pi alpha xp plus mu pi alpha yp. So it's a linear map. Uh, the second property is not just a linear map, it's an isomorphism. Pi alpha is an isomorphism, linear isomorphism of vector spaces with inverse. This is going to go from TQM to TPM given by parallel transport along alpha inverse, where alpha inverse is again a smooth curve defined by alpha inverse of t is alpha of a plus b minus t. So if you look at this, alpha inverse at the initial time is going to be alpha of b, and alpha inverse at the final time is going to be uh, alpha of a, which is p. So this is just following the, the same curve alpha in the opposite direction, starting at the final point, ending at the initial point. And in fact, it even has the, the same speed at every time, uh, the corresponding times. Okay, and the reason this is true, this is easy to check using the chain rule. And uh, the ODE theorem. Okay, so basically using the fact that alpha satisfies that, that uh, we know that if you have, if you have capital X, in other words, what I want to say, let me say it. So if uh, dtx equals zero, uh, let um, x inverse be x inverse of t is x of a plus b minus t. And then you can show that x inverse is parallel along alpha inverse, okay? Um, and therefore by uniqueness, you know, if you, if you give this, the initial condition pi, so then that gives you that pi alpha inverse of pi alpha of xp is equal to xp. Okay, so, so check the details. Parallel transport then is a linear isomorphism of tangent spaces. Of course, it depends on the curve. I can have some other curve, beta, with the same initial and final points. Parallel transport along beta will give me a linear isomorphism from TPM to TQM, but it's not going to be the same one in general. And in fact, the extent to which this parallel transport isomorphism depends on which path you took, that's called the holonomy of the connection or of the metric. And that's a very important property that's been studied a lot. It's not at all gonna be the subject of this course though, okay? But it's one of my uh, things that I think about a lot. So if you're interested, I can tell you more in office hours or some other time. Okay, so, uh, so we have this linear isomorphism given any curve alpha from P to Q, we have a linear isomorphism uh, from TPM to TQM. But we have more structure on TPM and TQM. We have metrics, inner products. So not surprisingly, because our connection, NABLA, is metric compatible, we forced it to play nicely with the metric. This parallel transport is also going to play nicely with the metric. And what could that possibly mean? It must mean that this is also an isometry. That's what we're going to prove next. Okay. So first, we need the following preliminary result. Let V and W be vector fields along alpha, um, then I can take the inner product. This is a smooth function from AB to the reals, right? Why is this smooth? Because what am I doing? I'm taking uh, V and W are varying smoothly in T and the metric varies smoothly on, on M. And therefore this is the, you can write down the, the details in local coordinates to look exactly what's happening. And you see this is a smooth function, okay? So the proposition says, 
I can look at this smooth function of t and I can take its derivative. This is equal to dtvw plus v dtw. Okay, this is some kind of product rule. And again, the reason we get this is because our connection is metric compatible. Really, you should think of this as having three objects in it, right? V and W and the inner product. We're differentiating one at a time and not the others, but there's no term where we leave V and W undifferentiated and just differentiate the inner product because that's exactly the term that is forced to be zero by our, our insistence that this connection be metric compatible. Okay, so why is this true? Again, it's a computation and there's a slick way using the, the notion of pullbacks, but let me just sketch the computational proof. Let X1 again to Xn be local coordinates. Uh, then I can write V as AI D by DXI, W as BJ D by DXJ, where AI and VJ are smooth real valued functions on AB. And if I take the inner product of V and W, it's bilinear. So this can be AI BJ times the inner product of D by DXI with uh, D by DXJ, and that's GIJ. And now you can see there why this is smooth, right? Because this is really, these are evaluated at T and this is evaluated at alpha of T. Alpha is smooth, G is smooth, everything is smooth. So that's the local coordinate expression for this inner product. Let's take D by DT. What we're gonna do is we're gonna write both of these expressions, both sides in local coordinates and see that they agree. And since the chart was arbitrary, it follows that they agree everywhere. So um, by the chain rule, the ordinary single variable calculus chain rule or multivariable calculus chain rule, if I take D by DT of this, this is a sum of products of functions. So I'm gonna have a term where I differentiate the A's and nothing else, a term where I differentiate the B's and nothing else, and a term where I differentiate the G's and I'm differentiating them with respect to T. So I have to remember that they depend on X's and the X's depend on T. That's a chain rule, sum over K. Okay, and let's look at the right-hand side of what we're trying to prove. If I compute dtvw plus v dtw, well, we already saw how to write this in local coordinates. Um, the ith component of this is gonna be dai dt plus dxp dt aq gamma pqi. And then I have BJ and GIJ. This is the ith component of DTV. And now here, I need the jth component of DTW. BQ, gamma PQ, J, GIJ. Uh, and that's the, that's the right-hand side. So how on earth are we gonna show that these two are equal? We have a formula in local coordinates for the Christoffel symbols in terms of derivatives of the metric. So from gamma kij gkm is one half, we talked about this last time, in fact first we, we arrived at uh, this formula and then we got the formula for gamma by multiplying both sides by the inverse of the metric okay but this is all we need here because if you look at where the gammas show up they're all contracted with a metric on the, the one lower index of the metric and the upper index on the gammas okay so we use oh boy i'm gonna have to do something different because this thing keeps falling We use this relation for this contraction 
and for this contraction. And so you'll be able to replace the gamma G by three metric derivatives, okay? And what's gonna happen is that one of them here is gonna cancel with one of them here. Another one here is gonna cancel with another one here. And the two that don't cancel will add up to give you this. So check that two of the six uh, D by D X something of G something something uh, cancel in pairs, four of the six cancel in pairs. And the other two add up to give the result. In other words, when you do that to this and you simplify, you get this. So that means this equals this in any coordinate chart. Okay, and let me make a comment here. Again, if you don't know about pullback bundles, you can ignore this and aside, um, alpha star G is a fiber metric on, um, on uh, alpha star TM and alpha star NABLA is alpha star G compatible. Again, ignore this if it doesn't make sense, but that's, um, it just says that the pullback, if you have a connection compatible with a metric and you pull everything back by a smooth map, the pullback connection is compatible with the pullback metric. That's all we've proved that. Okay, but because we don't have that language, I have to sort of do it by brute force. All right, so now we're able to prove, this basically says that parallel transport is an isometry. So let's just make that precise. Corollary. Pi alpha, which we just showed earlier is a linear isomorphism from TPM to TQM is an isometry with respect to GP on TPM and GQ on TQM. So I have a linear map between two inner product spaces. And I'm saying that it actually, uh, what I'm saying is that the pullback of this inner product by this linear map is this inner product. So the proof, let XP and YP be in TPM. Let X and Y be vector fields along alpha be, we know they exist and they're unique, they're unique such that X at A is X of P, Y at A is Y at P, and DTX is zero and DTY is zero. Okay, then D by DT of XY by the previous result, this is dtx y plus x dty. That's always true, but we've chosen this x and y to be parallel. So this smooth function, x inner product y, is a constant function because its time derivative is zero. So xy from A, B to R is constant. And then I have XP, YP is XY at time A, which is the same as XY at time B, which is um, X of B, Y of B, which is pi alpha XP, pi alpha YP. Yep. Yes, be the unique, be the unique vector fields along alpha that satisfy these two things. Yep. Okay. Um, so, so parallel transport along a given curve, not only is a linear isomorphism, in fact, it's an isometry. It plays super nicely with the inner products. 
Now, let me just say in words without writing it down, we're gonna be using this all the time. For example, because we know it's an isometry, suppose I take a, an orthonormal basis for the tangent space along at a point, okay? And then I choose a curve going to some other point. I can parallel transport each one of those tangent vectors along that curve. And because the inner product is preserved, it's not just, you know, it's not just that the inner product uh, is the same at P and at Q, it's the same at all time T throughout the curve. So if these vectors, tangent vectors at P are all orthonormal, then as I parallel transport them along this curve using the Levi-Civita connection, they'll be orthonormal everywhere along the curve. So I can get a frame along a curve, which is orthonormal at every point. We've just shown that we can do that. And that's gonna be very useful when we're gonna be doing some comparison geometry and looking at how geodesics uh, vary basically along a curve. It's gonna be very useful to have one of these frames along the curve, which is orthonormal at every point. And this is a proof that we can do it. Okay, so we're gonna change gears now. So this is a good time to see if there are any questions. Any questions online? Okay. I hope they can hear me and I hope I can hear them. So as I said, the, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about uh, geodesics. So really, I think we've covered everything I wanted from chapters one and two, more or less. We're gonna start talking about chapter three. Uh, the first few definitions here, I'm gonna go through again quickly because it's the kind of thing you see in any first course in Riemannian geometry. When we get to the exponential map, which I think I might get to today, I'll do that in, in, in gory detail. Cause I think that's, I mean, first of all, it's hugely important for the course, but also I think it's a little bit subtle. Um, but then when we get to curvature on Wednesday, again, that's gonna be more review stuff. Okay, so geodesics. We're gonna see that given uh, we have our, our Riemannian metric is fixed, we have our covariant derivative is fixed. We're gonna see that there's a distinguished class of curves. Throughout the, the, the lecture so far, we've been fixing one curve and doing, doing things with it. Covariant differentiation along the curve, parallel transport along the curve. Now we're going to be looking for curves that satisfy certain properties. Okay, so let's let alpha be a curve on M. Then the velocity vector field is a vector field along, along alpha. So we can covariantly differentiate this along alpha. DT alpha prime is a vector field along alpha. This is covariant differentiation along alpha. This is called the acceleration of alpha. ET alpha prime is called the acceleration of alpha. And it makes sense to call this the acceleration because we, we, show, we saw that covariant derivatives are basically directional derivatives. They're telling, telling you the rate of change of something in the direction of some tangent vector. And covariant differentiation along a curve is really the directional derivative in the direction of alpha prime. So we wanna see how fast is the velocity changing as you move in the direction of the curve. That should be the acceleration. And I wanna emphasize that the velocity vector field you can define on any smooth manifold. You don't need any additional structure at all. But to define this, you need, you need for us the metric. Where really all you need is a connection on the tangent bundle. Our, we're always gonna be taking the Levi-Civita connection of a Riemannian metric. So this depends on the metric. Okay, if you took some other metric, the acceleration of the same curve would be different. And now we make a definition. Alpha is called a geodesic. If it has zero acceleration. I.e if dt alpha prime equals zero on the domain of this curve. Okay, so, so that's the definition. We wanna show now that if I give you a point in the manifold and an initial velocity xp at that point, 
then there will exist a geodesic with that initial point and that initial velocity, but it may not exist for, for a long time. It might just exist for a small time. So here's a point P and let's take XP, let me call it VP. That's what I have in my notes and I'll get, I'll get confused if I change it. I take a, a point in M and I take a tangent vector at that point. Okay, so here's the proposition. Given P and VP, there exists epsilon positive and a unique smooth curve uh, gamma VP defined on minus epsilon epsilon to M such that First of all, it passes through P at time zero and it has velocity XP at time zero. So, so gamma VP at zero is P, gamma, v, gamma prime VP at zero is VP. Remember, this is going to be a tangent vector at gamma VP of zero, but that's P. So this is in TPM. Um, and the most important property, gamma is a geodesic on minus epsilon epsilon. Okay, so this is the initial point, and this is the initial velocity. We have to specify. For those of you who know some mechanics, right? If you, if you know that the acceleration is zero and you know the initial point and the initial velocity, then you know what the curve is. Um, so this is sort of a geometric version of that. We have to show that given P and, and VP, uh, we can find a geodesic for small time. I don't say anything about this epsilon. I just say there exists some positive epsilon. Just shout out question if I don't see you. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. So I'm being sloppy. So if in, in the sense that if there exists another one, the same P, the same V with some epsilon tilde, then on the minimum of epsilon and epsilon tilde, if you go from minus that to that, they're going to agree. That's right. And I'll make it more precise after we do this proof. Mm -hmm. Okay, so again, let x1 up to xn be local coordinates. Then alpha prime, alpha prime is going to be dxi dt d by dxi. Um, and let's say these are centered at p. So in other words, uh, xi, um, so alpha of t, the coordinate, I'm identifying uh, the chart with its image, right? And under that abusive notation, this really just says x1 of t up to xn of t are the coordinate functions for the components of alpha and those coordinates. Um, and it says that xi of zero is zero because I'm centering these coordinates at p. And xp is gonna be some ai d by dxi, that means I want ai to be dxi dt at zero. And this is really at p here. So the initial uh, point tells me the values of these functions, x1 of t up to xn of t at time zero, and I just chose my coordinate chart, so, so that's the origin. And the initial velocity, xp, uh, vp, sorry, vp, tells me what the time derivatives of these xi's are at time zero. And then if you compute the acceleration, which we've done before, what do I need to do? I need to take, uh, if, I, if I'm taking the covariant derivative along t of, along, of any vector field, I have to differentiate with respect to t the component functions. And the component functions are the time derivatives here. So I have to differentiate those with respect to time. Then I put the, uh, the, the dxi dt's, that's always there. And here I put the components of the vector field, 
but the vector field is alpha prime. So it has those. And then I have the gammas, x1 of t up to xn of t, and then d by dxk at alpha of t. Okay. So again, I want uh, I want the velocity, if I want the acceleration to be zero, this is the acceleration. So we set this equal to zero. Now we see a difference. This is still an ODE, a system of ODEs, but now the curve is the unknown and it's a second order system and it's fully nonlinear. This is a fully nonlinear second order system of ODEs. Before the curve was fixed in parallel transport and we were looking for a, a vector field along the curve. Right now the curve is the unknown and it's a second order equation. We need an initial point and an initial velocity. So it's linear in the second derivatives. It's only quadratic in the first derivatives, which is not too bad. But remember these functions of x1 up to xn could be horrible and in general they are, right? So it's very nonlinear in the zero derivatives. Nevertheless, the ODE theorem Still applies. Uh, the ODE theorem tells me if I have some system of ODEs, whatever order it is, doesn't have to be first or second, nth order ODEs, kth order, uh, and I have smooth coefficients, then given the initial conditions, and if it's a kth order system, you have to you have to specify the first k minus one derivatives at time zero. There exists a unique smooth solution, but if the system is not linear, we can only guarantee that that solution exists for small time. So by the ODE theorem, again, there exists a unique smooth solution for some, uh, for time T in minus epsilon epsilon for some epsilon positive. And because the equation is nonlinear, This is the best we can do in general. Okay, so you can easily write down nonlinear ODEs where the solution exists only for finite time. Um, we have just over 10 minutes. Good. So let's do an example, which is very simple. Let's take Rn with the Euclidean metric. Then we know that in the standard global coordinates, x1 up to xn, uh, we have that the gammas are zero in, this, in these coordinate charts for this metric, right? If I took some other metric on Rn, that wouldn't be true. And even with the Euclidean metric, if I took some other coordinate system like spherical coordinates, it wouldn't be true. Um, but, but in this coordinate system, I can write it down. And the geodesic equation is just d squared xk dt squared is zero because the gammas are all zero. And it's not, it's not nonlinear in this case, it's linear. Um, and the solution is that gamma VP of T is just P plus P. Right? This, if you write down the coordinate functions, the XKs are just the components of P plus T times the components of V, VP. Right? This definitely is linear in T, so the second derivatives are all zero. At time zero, we get P and gamma prime at time zero is VP. So this is just a straight line through P with um, gamma VP prime T equals VP for all T. Okay, so certainly at time zero, sorry. So here I'm using 
we're using the fact that the tangent space to Rn at any point Q is canonically isomorphic to Rn. So in other words, let's, let's take away the P there. Um, so VP, VP uh, corresponds to V, right? This is just the vector V in Rn translated to, to start at the point P. So, um, so in this case, we know what we get. We get a straight line and it exists for all time. Okay, because we, we knew we were going to get that because the equation turned out to be linear uh, and it's just a straight line um, going through P with direction vector V. Okay, let me make, um, so I'm going to come back to Vincent's comment about the time of existence for the geodesic in a minute, but I want to make a couple more remarks. So here's another example. Let's take SN with the induced metric. So you'll make this precise on, on homework one, but we have the, the Euclidean metric here. Whenever you have an immersion of one Riemannian of one manifold into a Riemannian manifold, you can pull back the metric by the immersion. And here the immersion is the inclusion map. So pulling back by the inclusion is just restriction and you get a metric there. That's called the round metric, round metric on SN. Uh, the geodesics are great circles. So they're intersections uh, with SN of uh, co-dimension uh, of um, two-dimensional linear subspaces of Rn plus one. So you're gonna put the, this is on assignment one. And for those of you who've done this before, by you know doing uh, spherical coordinates or something. That's how I gave some people to do it last year. I found a much, much simpler proof that I'm gonna walk you through, which doesn't involve any coordinates or any symmetry arguments. Lee does it in a very slick way using isometry groups and transitive actions of the isometry group. It's a very simple way of doing this. And I, I like it so much, I'm gonna put it on assignment one. Um, okay, but then here's a, here's a proposition. Let gamma from some, some open interval in the reals to M be a geodesic, then gamma has constant speed. In other words, if I take gamma prime and take the length squared of this, this is constant for all t in i, right? This is a smooth non-negative valued function of t. So this is immediate from the definition of a geodesic. Proof d by dt of the speed squared. Well, what's the speed squared? It's the inner product. Let me not put the T there. Uh, it's the inner product of velocity with itself. And that's equal to twice DT gamma prime gamma prime. And that's zero because it's a geodesic, right? So I'm using the fact that there's that product rule which came from metric compatibility. So if you're trying to keep track of how general is this result, if you have some random connection on the tangent bundle and it's compatible with a metric, then geodesics for that connection will have constant speed where the speed is computed with that metric. This doesn't use the torsion free condition. Um, so geodesics are constant speed, but then we make the following observation. We know that we can reparameterize curves, right? And for computing the length of the curve, it doesn't matter how we parameterize the curve. We can even reverse the orientation. But well, we can easily take a curve which has constant speed and reparameterize it to a, by a reparameterization so that it doesn't have constant speed anymore. Well, then it can't be a geodesic if it doesn't have constant speed, right? So this shows you that the property of being a geodesic, it doesn't only depend on the image of the curve, it really depends on the map. So the property 
of being a geodesic does not depend only on the image set gamma a b in m but rather on the smooth map gamma from i to m itself and you can already see that in this example right because we know if you have a straight line in rn we can parameterize it in lots of different ways just think about this as the path of some particle it can be moving really really fast and slowing down and then speeding up and then slowing down so so we can parameterize a straight line in lots of ways which don't have constant speed and they won't be geodesics because the geodesics all look like this okay so i'll say that here So we can already see this in the RN example. Okay, because a straight line that is reparameterized to have non constant speed. won't be a geodesic. Okay. Um, let me make, since I only have four, three minutes, let me make two more remarks and then we'll leave the next part for Wednesday. I got almost as far as I wanted to, which is pretty good because I usually get half as far as I want to. Um, so remark, remarks, first of all, if VP equals the zero vector, if your initial velocity is gonna be zero, then gamma VP of T is just P, is the constant curve at P, and is defined for all time. Okay, and that's easy to see because this curve does pass through P and has initial velocity VP and you can easily calculate that it's a geodesic. Okay. Um, okay, so maybe remark two, if gamma from I, let's just say, uh, okay, I to M is a geodesic, And um, F from I tilde to I is a diffeomorphism. So it's a reparameterization. These are both open intervals in the real line. And this F is a diffeomorphism. It's either going to have derivative everywhere positive, in which case it's orientation preserving, or everywhere negative, in which case it's orientation reversing. I'm going to write T in here and S in here. Then I can write gamma tilde of S is gamma of F of S is, a, is another curve. And now the question is, when is this a geodesic? So when is the reparameterization of a geodesic still a geodesic? And I'll leave this for you as an exercise to think about, but I actually, I'm gonna do it next time when I prove another result. So uh, exercise, Gamma tilde is again a geodesic if and only if um, F is affine linear. In other words, F of S is some AS plus B for A and B real numbers. Okay, so, so what this means is that what we can do is we can translate the time, the initial time, that's really irrelevant what the initial time is. And we can also dilate 
the time, what we think of as one unit of time, we can scale it by a constant. And that could be a negative constant if we change the direction. Uh, but that's the only thing you can do. So only translations and rescalings of the parameter preserve the property of being a geodesic. Okay, so that's an easy exercise. We're out of uh, time. Next time, I'm gonna tell you what it means to have a complete Riemannian metric. And then we're gonna look at the exponential map. The exponential map is gonna use geodesics to give us a preferred coordinate system in a neighborhood of every point. Those are called Riemannian normal coordinates. We are gonna maybe use those a couple of times, but more importantly than the special coordinate system is gonna be this exponential map, which is gonna really describe uh, in a very concrete way, how to think of the geodesics emanating from a particular point. Okay, and that's going to help us to understand how we how geodesics can change as you move in the manifold. And that's one of the first things we're going to be doing that's non-trivial. So, are there any questions? No. Nope. Yeah. We're going to prove that we haven't done. Yeah, I mean that's one of the big things coming up. Yeah, I, I just to exactly Sorry, the question was: geodesics are, are locally the shortest path between two points. That's something we will prove. Yeah. I'm, I'm just wondering if that's where the constant be the parameter like straight line. Or... Well, I mean that. I mean. Yeah, so you see a straight line is the shortest path between two points, but we, we really don't care about, uh, that's a curve with the shortest length, right? But you can reparameterize it. It's no longer a geodesic, but the length doesn't change. So we have to be very careful what we mean by the distance between two points or the shortest path between two points. So what, what we'll see is that there always exists, if the points are close enough in some sense, there always exists a shortest path between two points. And if you reparameterize it by, arc length, that's a geodesic. So it's coming in the next couple of lectures. Okay, so uh, yeah, we'll continue on Wednesday. I'm gonna post this part of assignment one over the weekend, but it's, it's not really coming in full force until the, the week after. Okay.